it is easy to say that the reason why the Philippines was occupied by Spain for 333 years is that they have good governance, that the Filipinos are docile and submissive to all the wills of the Spaniards. It is an oversimplification to say that the Spanish rule was peaceful and only come to an abrupt end because of the Katipunan and the Revolution. 1872 is the year that should not be named. Even mere mention of the year sends shivers to those who listen. It resulted in the deaths of the three Filipino priests collectively named as Gomburza. 1872 is not the first insurrection. It's just one of many. But nonetheless, the things that transpired in 1872 gave birth to a new batch of revolutionaries and nationalists. It sent shockwaves to the consciousness of the Filipinos. To effectively discuss the events of 1872, I would first discuss the background of the three priests that were implicated as the masterminds of Cavite Mutiny. Mariano Gomez was born on August 2, 1799 in Santa Cruz, Manila. He was a mestizo, which just means native mixed with European ancestry. He is of Filipino, Chinese, and Spanish lineage. He took theology at the University of Santo Tomas. On June 2, 1824, he was delegated as the head priest of Bacoor Cavite. Gomez is also part of the newspaper La Verdad, in which it describes the horrendous conditions of the country. He was the oldest of the three and has gained prior reputation as an anti-Espanol. Jacinto Zamora was also a mestizo priest. He began his education in Pandacan and later at the Coleo de San Juan de Letran, only to transfer at the University of Santo Tomas after finishing a Bachelor in Arts. He graduated with a degree of Bachelor of Canon and Civil Laws. He became a student preparing for priesthood in the seminary in Manila. After being ordained, Zamora handled parishes in Marikina, Pasig, and Batangas. On 1864, he was delegated to manage the Manila Cathedral. Jacinto Zamora is secretly a gambler and often plays cards after masses. This will become relevant later. Jose Burgos was born on Vigan, Ilocosur on February 9, 1837. Burgos is an academic, obtaining three bachelor degrees with honors, two master's degrees, and two doctorate degrees from Coleo de San Juan de Letran and from the University of Santo Tomas. Like the other two, Burgos is also a mestizo. After he was ordained, he became the second priest of the Manila Cathedral, fiscal of the ecclesiastical court, and professor and master of ceremonies of the University of Santo Tomas. He was regarded by some as a precursor to Rizal. Is a protege of Father Pedro Pelaez, the leader of the secularization movement that demanded the return of the control of the Philippine parishes to Filipino seculars. Burgos became famous for his nationalistic views, which can be seen in his editorial essays, where he championed political and religious reforms to empower the native clergymen. He also wrote articles defending the native clergymen in the Madrid newspaper La Discusión. All of these are reasons why he's a target of the Spanish elites, being seen as dangerous because he's trying to change the status quo. All the three priests were mestizos and are at the forefront of the secularization movement, which could explain the animosity towards them by the Spanish friars. From the discovery of the archipelago by Magellan, or should I say Magellan's landing in Mactan, the Spanish royalty saw the islands as a chance to gain new territories. And by 1565, a Spanish expedition by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi successfully and forcefully started the colonization. The colonization didn't look like this. It looked like this. Plus this. After the conquistadors brought the islands under the rule of the Spanish monarchy, Spain did not send a large amount of military to consolidate its empire. The missionaries followed after the efforts of the conquistadors, where the Spanish missionaries acted as de facto conquerors. They successfully used and weaponized religion for their cause. The islands were ruled over by the Spanish government, but the friars specifically have a large amount of influence on the citizenry and the government. There's a scarcity of Spanish officials in the islands, most often, the friars are the only Spaniard in towns, 
they are knowledgeable of the native language and normally stay in a town for a long time. The friars have authority in the administration of the colony. They supervise elections. They are the keeper of the list of residents in a town. His signature is required to be seen in all financial papers of the town. These friars are part of the five orders who were assigned to Christianize the natives. The Augustinians who came with Legaspi, the Franciscans, the Jesuits, the Dominicans, the Recollects. In 1594, they agreed to cover specific areas of the archipelago to effectively perform their duties. They organized cities and coerced Filipinos to live in a compact community. They justified their actions by stating that more compact communities allow for a richer understanding of Christianity. They suppressed all native religions, often by force. By the 17th century, they already transformed the lifestyle of the natives and created large villages. They spread far enough to allow for one cabecera or a capital parish and small chapels located throughout the villages. Each parish is managed by a priest, which can be divided into two distinct categories, the regulars and the seculars. The regulars are the priests from the orders and the seculars are natives or mestizo priests. During the 18th century, secularization had already begun in the Western world and by 1759, King Charles III of Spain ushered a policy subjecting the church to the control of the crown. Secular priests did not come from any order and were trained to run parishes and were subjects of the bishops. The bishops were appointed by the crown and the religious orders defied the bishops. The conflict began when the bishops insisted on visiting parishes that are managed by the regulars. While the bishops argued that it is their duty to check the administration of these parishes, the regulars insisted that they are not under the jurisdiction of the bishops. They soon threatened to leave their parishes if the bishops won't stop insisting. During this time, Jesuits were already expelled from the country, which is caused by a variety of reasons, one of which is that they have conflicting interests with Spain. In 1774, Archbishop Basilio Santa Justa accepted the resignation of the regular priests, in which he assigned secular priests to replace them. Secularization policy was implemented under Governor General Simon de Anda, which coincided with the royal cedula that is issued on November 9, 1774, calling for the secularization of all parishes or transfer of parochial authority to the secular priests. The archbishop hastened the ordination of the Filipino seculars because there's a shortage caused by the vacancies. The regulars are vocal about their disdain against this policy, which they view Filipino seculars as unfit and incompetent for the priesthood. They hurl racist remarks against the secular and even implicated the native priest with leading a future uprising against Spain. Spain had experience with this in Peru and Mexico, where the native priests led a revolt and waged a war of independence. In 1826, the secularization policy was overturned by the Spanish government. Even the Vatican discouraged the religious orders in governing parishes, but their control is not absolute. Decisions from the Vatican are not directly implemented in the Philippines because the decision still lies in the hands of the Spanish government. The religious orders use their influence in the Spanish government to ensure their permanence in the parishes, effectively not following the wishes of the Vatican. The rule of the regulars was continued and was dominant. The return of the Jesuits only furthered the intensity of the animosity against the seculars. The friars are violating the rights of the secular clergy. They're denying the seculars the right to administer a parish because of their race and baseless accusation of inferiority to Europeans. This brings us back to Father Pedro Pelaez and his goal to return the control of the parishes to the seculars. He died at age 50 because of an earthquake. Jose Burgos continued the advocacy of Father Pedro Pelaez with the rest of the secularization movement. On January 20, 1872, about 200 soldiers, citizens, and laborers of the arsenal rose up and attacked the Spanish arsenal in Cavite. Led by Sergeant Francisco La Madrid, they successfully seized Fort San Felipe. The insurgents are expecting support from their fellow soldiers to rise up, but that didn't happen. Two days later, the fort was stormed by Spanish forces, and after an hour of battle, the fort was easily taken back. They found the commander of the fort dead. Let's take a step back and ask, what happened and what led to this mutiny? 
there are various perspectives on what exactly happened and what led to it. One of the reasons put forward is the abolition of the privileges of the arsenal workers, to pay taxes and to do forced labor, polo e servicio. That this is just a mere mutiny out of dissatisfaction. Some see it as a mutiny instigated by the friars to frame the three priests who were advocating for the restoration of the parishes to the secular priests. That this event could be a pretext to execute or exile the three priests and their allies which consist of lawyers and businessmen pushing liberal reforms. Some textbook even goes to say that there was a friar that pretended to be Burgos in the crowd which led the mutiny. Records of the trials have not been found. Accounts of the events are conflicting with each other. Research by John Schumacher on the recently found 60 pages letter of Governor General Rafael Vizquierdo to the overseas minister could shed some new light on the events that transpired. It is also accompanied by a report of the acting commander of the Navy. This document supersedes the earlier account of Izquierdo, written hours after the suppression of the mutiny, which contains obvious errors. On January 19, Izquierdo received an anonymous letter which states the following, I make known to you that I was informed this very night in the market here and in the walls on Friday or Saturday of this week they will fire a cannon shot in the fort of Manila, the sign of the revolt against the Spaniards. They are taking this occasion since the squadron is not here. The one who is acting as the head of the revolt is the very reverend Father Burgos in Manila and in Cavite the artillery sergeants and the corporal of the native marines. Being alerted of this planned insurrection, they instilled fear in the minds of the Filipino soldiers by saying that they are already aware of their plans so that they will not continue with the revolt. That happened to the 300 men who signed up and pledged to the revolt. The three regiments in Manila and Cavite remained loyal to Spain and even drove the insurrectionists out of Fort San Felipe. Izquierdo suggests that this is part of a larger conspiracy, a revolt for independence, which is supported by the later interrogation of Bonifacio Octavo, a sergeant who pledged to the revolt only to change his mind and desert before it started. He was captured on the following September. From the interrogation, it became clear that they planned the mutiny as early as November or December of 1871. This comes into conflict with the earlier motive regarding the policy issued by Izquierdo about taxes and forced labor. The policy was only announced 20 days before the mutiny and there's been quite an extensive planning for months before the announcement and according to the report, there were no workers of the arsenal that joined the mutiny. He clarified that there were only 38 artillery men and 54 marines. Perhaps the policy only helped to further the emotion and anger towards the Spanish government. Though it is also possible that all the answers of Octavo are only gained through threats. It is also worth noting that there were two Spanish soldiers that joined the insurrection. Montesinos and Morcuencio. It is impossible to say for certain what their motives are but it's most likely about the resentment against their imprisonment. Montesinos was imprisoned over gambling debts for several times. Their involvement supports the claim of Izquierdo and Octavo with respect to the motive of the mutiny. That this is not just a mere mutiny over grievances but a larger conspiracy that intends to overthrow the Spanish rule. If the Filipinos became successful in overthrowing Spanish rule, they could expect to be free and likely hold positions in the Filipino army. When the failure of the revolt is imminent, Morcuencio committed suicide. According to Izquierdo, the revolt was set to begin in the early hours after midnight in Manila, with the signals of the insurgent in Cavite given by skyrockets. Though it is thought that the insurgents in Cavite mistook the fiesta in Sampaloc with their fireworks as the signal. Either way, they went into arms between 8 to 9 p.m. instead of waiting for the signal in Manila. They planned to set fire in Tondo, so the authorities will be preoccupied with putting the fire off, while the artillery regiment and some of the infantry stationed nearby would take possession of Fort Santiago and fire cannons as a signal to Cavite. They plan to kill all Spaniards who won't beg for their life, excluding the women, and they would proclaim independence from the Spanish rule. There's also a story of a Spanish sergeant who discovered the plan through his lover. The sergeant went to report the plot 
to his superiors who informed Izquierdo. He came and instilled fears into those who thought they are discovered, though this should be taken with a grain of salt. It is noteworthy that during this time, the central government in Madrid has announced their intention to remove from the friars all powers of intervention in matters of civil governance and the management of educational institutions. The central government of Spain took pleasure in the education decree authored by Segismundo More, which promoted the fusion of sectarian schools run by the friars into a school called the Philippine Institute. This proposal would greatly increase the standard of education in the Philippines, for the teaching profession will now require passing a competitive examination. The friars know that they are slowly losing influence over the Philippines and saw this as an opportunity. They presented it to the Spanish government as a large conspiracy bent on overthrowing the Spanish rule in the islands. Whatever the motivation of the mutineers or the priors, it's important to remember that this led to the execution and the death of the three priests. Even before the suppression of the mutiny, arrests were already made. Hence, these arrests were not based on the interrogation of the insurgents. The Jesuit diary of Ateneo Municipal, dated January 21, states that Father Burgos, Zamora, Guevara, Pardo de Tavera, Regidor, and others were already arrested. On the report of Izquierdo to the overseas minister, hours after the suppression, he added Father Agustin Mendoza, Feliciano and Mariano Gomez, Jose and Piyu Basa, and Enrique Paraiso, but omits Zamora. Father Mariano Gomez was also captured on the night of January 21 with his nephew, Feliciano Gomez, who was staying with him due to sickness. Zamora was believed to be arrested later and was even not aware of the revolt until the next morning. His house was searched and they found a note. Big reunion. The friends will come well supplied with bullet and powder. That note is enough evidence for them to arrest Zamora. It is important to note that those priests and laymen in custody are captured during the revolt before any evidence and investigation. Izquierdo believes those captured are guilty of some complicity in the revolt and are deserving of punishment. He also stated that those who will be found guilty would be executed and even those who will be proven innocent will be exiled to the Marianas. When the investigation started, the name of Feliciano Gomez was removed but others were added. However, he insisted that the instigators of the insurrection were among the prisoners, priests, and laymen captured. He also inferred that the planned revolutionary government will probably be headed by Father Burgos or Father Zamora. Historian Manuel Artigas assembled eight declarations during the interrogations, which he claims exist but now appears to be lost in the Philippine National Archives. The alleged declarations names Burgos as the head of the revolutionary government. For him, the unanimity of the declarations was only made possible due to torture. The evidence against Burgos was scarce. The fact that even Bonifacio Octavo points Burgos as a leader of the planned revolt even if he never met him personally. It turns out he only heard all of this through Francisco Zaldúa, the one who supposedly had connections with Burgos. Even La Madrid had no acquaintance with Burgos except through Zaldúa. It can easily be inferred that Zaldúa used the name of Burgos as a means of recruitment. Burgos is already well known. It appears that Zaldúa is the principal recruiter in the revolt and it is on his word that Zamora and Burgos were implicated by Izquierdo. The anonymous note that Izquierdo received might have come from a soldier like Octavo, a deserter that also heard from Zaldúa that Burgos is the leader. Izquierdo's account of the Cavite mutiny centers on Burgos. If you take into consideration the things that Burgos did before this, it's improbable that he's actually aware or complicit to the revolt. There's an anonymous pamphlet that circulated in 1864 that some believe he wrote, which criticizes the church and the hoaxes against the native clergy. Yes, he's been very vocal in defending the native clergy, but there's still no definitive proof that he actually wrote those. Burgos is known to follow rules, even making a memorial through slow bureaucracy, which calls for the revocation of the decree in 1861. The memorial calls for the return of the parishes to the secular priest, though this fact wasn't known until the memorial was done and Burgos already died. He gathered almost all the signatures of the Manila clergy, 
which is a testimony to the ability of Burgos to inspire the native clergy. What is important here is that he's putting a lot of effort to work within the confines available under the Spanish government at the time he was persecuted. All this activity would not make sense if he were really involved in a plot to overthrow the Spanish rule in which he just calls for reform. I said earlier that Zamora was a gambler. The letter found on him that states something about powders and bullets is gambler slang for bringing the money. This is the only physical evidence against him. Gomez's innocence is questionable. When he was arrested, they found nearby an abandoned boat with arms. Being the oldest between the three, he was already seen as an enemy of the friars as early as 1849. The older generation of seculars view the strategy of the new generation, Burgoses, as admirable but they are not convinced with the results. On the examination of the signatures gathered on the memorial, the signature of Mariano and his nephew Feliciano was nowhere to be found. This is noteworthy because almost the whole Manila clergy signed. Whether he sympathized or is complicit to the mutiny is still not clear. But if he actually did, it could explain the courage he had before he was executed. On the research of John Schumacher, he theorized that the three priests were innocent. He speculates that Maximo Innocencio, Crisanto de los Reyes, and Enrique Paraiso were the true masterminds behind the revolt. The three were sentenced to death but were secretly commuted by Izquierdo for being fellow Masons. They were instead exiled. Zaldúa and La Madrid were the immediate instigators in Cavite and Paraíso was likely the one who recruited the regiments in Manila. The real planners of the revolt were the three men who employed them. Izquierdo was sure of the complicity of these three but chose to only exile them. Was there actually any chance that they would be successful in removing the Spanish rule in the Philippines? Yes, in the whole country there were only 300 Spanish soldiers and 8,874 native soldiers. If they successfully have taken the key points as planned, it is possible that other Filipino soldiers would follow. If only Izquierdo was not aware of the plan, they could have surprised the Spanish forces. On February 17, 1872, the three priests were publicly executed at Bagumbayan, which is now Luneta Park. Based on the accusation of treason and sedition, they were executed by garrote, in which a person would sit and be tied to a chair. The victim would be strangled as a large metal screw would penetrate at the back of the neck, breaking the spine and killing the person. Francisco Zaldúa thought that his confession would save his life and he was promised to be spared if he will speak. He was the first to be executed. Next is Gomez. According to the research of Luis Derry, Gomez said the following to his nephew, Huwag kang lumuha anak, ang tunay na nagmamahal sa lupang tinubuan ay hindi namamatay sa higaan. Gomez received his fate with tranquility and courage as if he already accepted his fate. He's already old and he knows he's got nothing more to lose. Sources say that Jacinto Zamora already lost his mind, being disoriented the past days and staring blankly. He died without saying any last words. Burgos cried like a child. He believes he's innocent and he's still young. With an age of 35, he's already achieved so much. He resisted and a dozen friars surrounded him and pressed him on his seat. Feeling the grip of the tie around his arms, he protested once more of his innocence. So was Jesus Christ, said one of the friars. Burgos calmed and accepted his fate. The executioner kneeled down and asked for forgiveness. Burgos replied, I forgive you my son, do your duty. It was done. The archbishop sounded all the bells of the church in honor of their deaths. They were buried in an unmarked grave. The Gumburza are martyrs. Some don't consider them heroes, and I get it. They didn't fight for the Filipinos as a whole. They fought for the rights of the native clergy, and it's arguable if they even cared about the welfare of the common folk. I want to remind you that these priests, even before they died, were able to inspire and had courage to call for reforms 
against the administration of the oppressive regulars. And they did it in a country where the word freedom is not yet common in the vocabulary of the people. Whatever happened in 1872, it is clear that it influenced, if not directly resulted, in the events that happened in 1896 and 1898. I think it's important to be aware of the calm before the storm. The loudest noise comes after the deafening silence. The moment the bells rung on the death of the martyrs, something inside the Filipinos who witnessed it awoke. It is as if one saw behind the curtains and see the truth about the Spanish regime, the true oppressive nature of it. As Emilio Jacinto said, 24 years had since passed, but the excruciating wound inflicted that day on Tagalog hearts had never healed. The bleeding had never staunched. Though the lives of the three priests had been extinguished that day, their legacy would endure forever. Their compatriots would honor their memory and would seek to emulate their pursuit of truth and justice. Pasiano Rizal saw the execution of Father Burgos. He's a student of him, and they are close. Pasiano then relayed the information to the young Jose, and the nationalist seeds were planted in his young mind. If not for the death of the three priests, Jose Rizal as we know him today won't exist. Even the name Rizal was not his real surname. They changed it to dissociate with Pasiano, who has close ties with Burgos. Pasiano is a good brother to Rizal. He supported him financially and morally. Jose Rizal thought if at his death Burgos had shown the courage of Gomez, the Filipinos of the day would be other than they are. However, nobody knows how he will behave at that culminating moment. And perhaps I, myself, who preach and boast so much, may show more fear and less resolution than Burgos in that crisis. Life is so pleasant and it's so repugnant to die in a scaffold, still young and with ideas in one's head. He also died a martyr. The same with the three priests, but unlike Burgos, Rizal had shown the courage of Gomez. In 1898, the Philippines would declare independence from Spain. In 1998, the graves of the three priests were accidentally found by Manila City Engineer's Office under the ladies' comfort room in Paco Park. The comfort room was already removed and the marker was on its place. I think it's important to not forget the lessons from the past. That sometimes the cost of waking up and removing the cover from our eyes is a life. The greatest sacrifice. Before Father Burgos was executed, while he was still in his prison cell, he wrote a message addressed to the Filipino youth. Get educated. Use the schools of our country for as much as they can give. Learn from our older men what they know. Then go abroad. If you can do no better, study in Spain but preferably study in freer countries. Read what foreigners have written about the Philippines for their writings have not been censored. See in the museum of other lands what the ancient Filipinos really were. Be a Filipino always, but an educated Filipino. Heretofore, we have had thinkers among us, but their thoughts have died with them. Such progress as has been made has been individual and not of the country. I have tried to pass on to you what I have received from my teachers. Do you now do the same for those who come after you?